Okay, so um, today, this chapter 15 then is talking all about that somatic nervous system, right? The somatic nervous system. So soma means body. So we're looking at, and, and this one isn't just efferent, it's not just motor commands. This one has both sensory information coming in and motor information going out. And so um, the, you know, the cranial nerves, um, several of the cranial nerves have motor um, commands going out to muscles. Several of them have sensory neurons coming in. Um, and then every single spinal nerve has sensory information coming in and motor information coming out. So we're looking at all of those cranial nerves and all of those spinal nerves. Right? So let's um, take a look at document camera here. All right, so we're going to draw in the brain and the spinal cord, okay? And then here's that central sulcus right there, okay? And then we have the, this is the post-central gyrus. And the function of the post-central gyrus is that it is the sensory cortex. And we really call it the primary sensory cortex. Primary sensory cortex. And then we have this gyrus in front of the central sulcus. And we call that the pre-central gyrus. and it functions as the motor cortex. So we call that, it's the primary motor cortex. We call it the primary motor cortex. All right, so first we're gonna talk about um, the sensory somatic nervous system. That's with sensory information coming in. And so we'll look at the, um, you know, we'll look out here Sensory um, information travels through what type of neuron? Is it multipolar or is it unipolar? Sensory. Okay, S unipolar. Sensory information travels through a unipolar neuron. So we have little dendrites out here. Those are dendrites. We have the long axon going into the spinal cord, and then we have the synaptic terminal. And then the cell body hangs off to the side. That's a unipolar neuron. That's a sensory neuron. Information is traveling in. Okay? So in the somatic nervous system, we're going to call this sensory neuron a first-order neuron. First order. That's the one that brings information into the spinal cord. Whether it's something that you're feeling like pain or temperature changes or vibration or touch, it's all it's going to come in through a spinal nerve. Then that's going to synapse onto dendrites inside the spinal cord and then the axon is going to go up to its synaptic terminal, and that synaptic terminal is in the final relay station that we call the what? Thalamus, right? So that's the thalamus. And there's our little cell body hanging off to the side, okay? So that's that sensory neuron. This sensory neuron we're going to call a second order neuron. We've got the first one and the second one. The thalamus then is going to decide where do I send this to. And so there's going to be a third neuron. Here's the dendrites. Here's the axon. And it's going to go up to that primary sensory cortex. And there's the little cell body hanging off to the side. This neuron we're going to call the third order neuron. OK, 
Okay, so that's how it's going to work. It's going to have. We're just going to have um, the activation of the first order neuron that activates the second order neuron that activates the third order neuron, and now your primary sensory cortex, um, along with its association area, can help you to understand what you just felt, pain, temperature, whatever. Okay. So, which root does this sensory neuron come into the spinal cord through? Dorsal or ventral? Which one carries sensory neurons? The dorsal root or the ventral root? Okay, these are exam questions. These are things you have to know. It comes through the dorsal root to come into the spinal cord. So that's sensory. Sensory neurons enter the spinal cord through the dorsal roots, right? Okay, so this part, this is the somatic sensory nervous system. Okay, the somatic sensory nervous system. And what chapter 15 focuses on, what we're going to focus on, are the dendrites out here, okay, and the specialized cells that surround those dendrites. All right, so we've got these groups of specialized cells, and those specialized cells are called receptors. And there's several different types of receptors that we need to know about. So receptors can either be specialized cells that are surrounding the dendrites, or they can be the dendrites themselves. If they're the dendrites themselves, we call them free nerve endings because they don't have specialized cells surrounding them. So we're going to go over the different classifications of receptors. But before we do that, let's talk about the somatic motor nervous system, right? So this is where um, there's the brain is sending out motor commands to skeletal muscles. Right? We already did the autonomic nervous system in chapter 16. Now this is talking about somatic nervous system, the motor part. So we're going to look at um, a motor neuron. And motor neurons are what? Are they unipolar or multipolar? Yep, motor neurons are multipolar. And they're going to start in this primary motor cortex. That's where all the commands that go out to your skeletal muscles start. So here we have our, there's our cell body, and we've got all of these dendrites. Those are all the poles. And then we have a long axon. That's another pole. And then that synapses on another neuron um, on the, in the spinal cord, At, depending on you know, which level depends on where is it going to go? Is it going to your arms or your legs? Which skeletal muscle is it actually going to? Is it going to the SCM and the trapezius? Well, that's going to be the cranial nerve um, 11, right? Is it going to the masseter? Well, then that's coming out through cranial nerve 5. So it just depends. The level of where it comes out depends on which skeletal muscle it's going to. Okay. All right, so um, this neuron we call an upper motor neuron upper motor neuron. And it synapses onto another motor neuron, so again another multipolar neuron. And that multipolar neuron leaves the central nervous system and its synaptic terminal is going to end on a skeletal muscle. So there's our skeletal muscle. Right? So it ends on the skeletal muscle. And this second neuron here, we're going to call a lower motor neuron. So we've got an upper motor neuron, and it synapses on a lower motor neuron, and then that goes out to the skeletal muscle. So we call this whole thing, both the sensory portion and the motor portion, we call that somatic, because we're talking about pretty much the whole body. We're not and, it, and it's more, um, the skeletal muscles are um, more voluntary. In the autonomic nervous system, that was all automatic. That way, that's why it was called autonomic. Okay. 
So this is the somatic nervous system. Now what we need to focus on is um, these receptors right here, and we're going to look at the different classifications of receptors. So do you guys have any questions on this, on these pathways? When you get to advanced, um, we're going to talk about all the pathways that these neurons take, these second order and third order neurons and these upper motor neurons take to get to the brain. Okay, um, But this is all we need to know for this one. Now, let's take a look at the receptors then. So we classify receptors. And we can classify them either by their location in the body or by their function. So we're going to start by looking at um, the location of receptors. Okay. So we have receptors. Um, they can either be interoceptors exteroceptors or proprioceptors okay these are locations so we think about um, the word intero and that sounds like what inside or outside Sounds like inside, right? So interoceptors are going to be found in your viscera, organs, okay? So um, when you get like a stomach cramp and your stomach is cramping and you feel that and you, your brain gets the message that it's cramping, that's going to be an interoceptor that's doing that. That's the location of the it's interoceptor. Exteroceptors, these are found in your skin. So when you have pain in your skin, you know, from a cut, from a bruise, that's going to be an exteroceptor that's detecting that. And then we have proprioceptors. And proprioceptors are found in your joints and your muscles. Joints and muscles. Okay, so those are locations of receptors. And now um, we're going to classify receptors based on their function. So what are they detecting, basically? So function. Okay. And the first one that we have is called a um, nociceptor. A nociceptor detects pain. So these are specialized receptors that can detect pain. You cut a tissue, you bruise a tissue, that's painful. It's pain receptors that pick that up, nociceptors or nociceptors. Um, extreme temperatures, the nociceptors will become activated in extreme temperatures. Extreme cold, you know when you have extreme cold, it's painful. You put a hand over a flame and it gets too hot, that's painful, right? So those nociceptors will be activated with extreme temperatures as well. The second type of um, receptor is called a thermoreceptor. Thermoreceptor or thermoceptor. Um, those detect heat and cold. So they're detecting when there's some in the skin. So when the skin heats up, there's some in the hypothalamus. So when the blood's heating up and it goes past the hypothalamus, you can detect um, the temperature changes. There are more cold receptors. There are more cold thermal receptors than there are hot or heat thermal receptors. The third type of um, receptor classified by locate by um, function is called a um, mechanoreceptor. And a mechanoreceptor is sensitive to distortion. So what do I mean by distortion? 
I mean, those receptor cells have to actually be distorted by pressure, or they have to, the dendrites have to bend. Okay, that's what a mechanoreceptor is. There's an actual distortion to either the receptor cells or the dendrites. And there's three different types of mechanoreceptors. The first type of mechanoreceptor is called a tactile receptor. And this one is sensitive to touch. So it doesn't matter if it's a deep touch or light touch. It doesn't matter if it's crude touch or fine touch. These receptors just respond to touch. So you press lightly, if you rub lightly on the skin, there's um, receptors close to the skin that are picking that up. That's a tactile receptor. If you push down on your skin, there are receptors deeper in the skin that are picking that information up. Those are tactile receptors. The second type of mechanoreceptor is called a baroreceptor. And a baroreceptor is sensitive to pressure um, or stretch. Okay, pressure or stretch. So baroreceptors are found in a couple of different locations. What is that? I have no idea. It looks like red and yellow. Oh, maybe they're painting. Okay, we're almost done. So hang in there. Um, so the baroreceptors. Your urinary bladder, the walls are filled with baroreceptors. When your urinary bladder fills up with urine, those baroreceptors get triggered. It sends um, action potentials to your brain, tells your brain it's time to go to the bathroom and urinate. And then you get rid of that pressure. Okay? There's other baroreceptors that are found in your blood vessels, like your carotid artery. The carotid artery is going to come up and feed your brain with blood. Well, if you have too much pressure in that blood vessel, if there's too much blood in that blood vessel, and that gets to your brain, those blood vessels could burst, the little tiny ones, and that would be a big problem. So those baroreceptors, if your blood pressure is too high and there's too much blood on the walls of those blood vessels, those baroreceptors start firing, the message gets to your brain, and your brain says, I've got to get rid of some of this fluid. How's it going to get rid of fluid? It's going to send a command out after that to tell your body to urinate. That's really, you know, you're going to urinate to get rid of the fluid, okay? And then that's going to help to bring that pressure down on those blood vessels. All right, so those are baroreceptors. And then the third type of mechanoreceptor um, is called a proprioceptor. So a proprioceptor, of course, we said um, location-wise, it's found in joints and muscles, and that's true. Function-wise, proprioceptors are going to detect body position. Body position. All right. So no matter what you're doing, you have proprioceptors in your body that are constantly being activated. You're sitting there, and your proprioceptors have to fire and start action potentials so that your brain knows you're sitting, so that motor commands can go out and the appropriate muscles will contract so that you sit and don't fall over. Same thing when you're standing, right? Your proprioceptors are always firing. If you're standing on one foot, you have proprioceptors firing. They're just constantly firing, letting your brain know what position your body is in so that your muscles, the appropriate muscles, contract and keep you in that position without you falling over. Right? Okay. So the only time they wouldn't be firing is if you were laying down and you were very, very still and not moving. Okay? All right. So then um, finally, the last um, receptor that we classify as function we have nociceptor, thermoreceptor, mechanoreceptor. We come to a chemoreceptor. And chemoreceptors, they are going to respond to chemicals. Chemicals, okay? 
So, of course, when we're thinking of chemicals, we're going to think about, all right, well, when you smell, that's chemicals coming in. The mucus is going to, in your nasal cavity, it helps to break up those chemicals, and then they stimulate the nerve endings of your olfactory nerve, right? Those nerve endings of the olfactory nerve are, those are receptors, those are chemoreceptors, because you're picking up the chemicals. Your taste, your taste buds, they're picking up the chemicals of things that you eat and drink, so those are chemoreceptors. But I think um, the more important ones in our body are when um, the receptors that detect the pH levels, the, o the oxygen levels, and the carbon dioxide levels. Okay. So those are um, important chemoreceptors, and those again are found in blood vessels. Like, for instance, in that same area in the carotid artery, again, that blood's going into your brain. Your brain needs to know that it has the proper amount of oxygen, that there's enough oxygen. If there's not enough oxygen, it's firing messages to your brain telling you to breathe faster, to get more oxygen in, right? The other thing is the carbon dioxide. You do not want high levels of carbon dioxide in your brain. You'll pass out, right? So when that carbon dioxide level gets too high, it's going to send a message to your brain. Your brain's going to make you breathe out faster. Or if you guys um, went through biochemistry, you will um, urinate out hydrogen faster. Okay. Um, and then also pH. The pH um, is going to be monitored too because a low pH is an acidic environment. Acidic environments are not good. So that's um, going to either um, convert carbonic acid into carbon dioxide that you can breathe out to get rid of the acidity or into hydrogen so you can urinate that out. Okay. So anyway, those are the chemoreceptors. Just a couple more things then that I want to go over with you. And then we're finishing up here. Okay, so this picture here is showing the um, sensory portion of the somatic nervous system. This red one down here, this red neuron, this is our, um, this is our first order neuron, synapses onto a second order neuron that goes up to the thalamus, and that synapses onto the third order neuron, and that goes up to this gyrus, which is the post-central gyrus, which we call the primary sensory cortex. So that's the pathway, right? So we talked about the pathway. Now, when we look at that um, gyrus, that gyrus is big, right? It's a big gyrus. It comes up and then it goes down into that longitudinal fissure. It's a big gyrus. So where does that sensory information land? It's one little neuron. It's got to land on one little place. How does it know where to land? Well, over the years, um, scientists have mapped out a distorted body figure on that sensory cortex that we call the sensory homunculus. Homunculus. So it looks like a distorted body. And that distorted body is the homunculus. So if for example, you bit your lip and you were getting pain in your lip, this third order neuron would end up at this area of the cortex because that's where you're feeling pain. So that's how your brain knows where you felt that pain because it landed at that little location on the sensory cortex. If you cut your finger, it's going to, the sensory, this third order neuron is going to end right here. If you stub your toe, it's going to end right here inside that longitudinal fissure. So it's completely mapped out with this distorted figure that we call a sensory homunculus. Okay. Now we have the same thing in the motor, um, somatic motor nervous system. Here's one of the pathways in the somatic motor nervous system. 
we start in that motor, that post, that precentral gyrus, which is the primary motor cortex. So here's the motor neuron. It starts up here and it travels down synapses onto the lower motor neuron and that goes out to the skeletal muscle. Okay. So the upper motor neuron is going to start on that precentral gyrus or that primary motor cortex. Where does it start? It's a big cortex. Well, again, we have a motor homunculus mapped out on there. So if you're going to, if you want to move your thumb, that motor command is going to come from this area of the motor cortex. If you're going to move your tongue, it's coming from this area of the motor cortex. If you're going to move your toe, it's moved, it's coming from this area of the motor cortex. So it's perfectly mapped out. Your body is perfectly mapped out on here. Okay? And you can see some areas are bigger and some areas are smaller. Okay? These smaller areas, they just have larger motor units, so they don't need as many neurons. So there's not as much neural um, um, tissue designated for it. So that's what the homunculus is. Okay? That, that it's a, a map. Now, the other important thing that I want to show you about this, um, the motor, somatic motor, is that if you see up here, the first upper motor neuron, it's always going to cross over to the opposite side of the spinal cord, which means that that right precentral gyrus is going to control the muscles on the left side of your body. And that means that the left primary motor cortex is going to control all the skeletal muscles on the right side of your body because it always crosses over, okay? So if you have a stroke, a person has a stroke on the left side of their brain, it's going to affect their activity, their muscle activity on the right side of their body, okay? And then the last thing, I want to go back and look at the sensory. Okay, this, the, uh, um, this is just one of the pathways, but when in the, in the sensory pathways, in the somatic sensory, where we have things coming in, first order, second order, third order, all that sensory information is coming in, um, there are other interneurons that are involved as well. Interneurons are synapsing on these neurons in there, okay? And those interneurons are sometimes um, there's a predictable pattern that those interneurons will go to another area on that somatic sensory map, on the sensory homunculus, and make you think you're having pain somewhere other than where the pain is actually occurring. Do you guys know what that's called? Referred pain, right? Referred pain. So if we look at this picture here, this is showing some predictable patterns that medical people know about. When a person is having a heart attack and they're having pain in their heart, those interneurons are sending information to a predictable other location in that somatic sensory, in that primary sensory cortex. And that person will end up with left shoulder pain, left arm pain, left jaw pain, back pain. Okay, that's very predictable. So when a doctor hears you're having left shoulder pain and left arm pain and you did nothing um, to injure your musculoskeletal system, they're immediately going to be thinking heart attack, right? Something's going on with the heart. Same thing we see with the um, liver and gallbladder. The liver and gallbladder is on the right side of the body. If you're having a gallbladder attack, those inner neurons um, might be sending a message to the right shoulder, right? To the area on that sensory cortex where your right shoulder is. It's predictable. You have right shoulder pain. That could indicate that you're having a gallbladder attack. Same thing with in the males. Same thing with kidney infections. Kidney infections refer to the testicles, to the testes. So a male that's having testicular pain and everything turns out fine with the testes, could be that they're having actually kidney infections. So they'll, they'll do some immediate, um, they'll do some 
um, work up on the kidneys to make sure there's no infection there. So that's referred pain. And that's because of the interneurons. Um, that's because of those interneurons that are going off to other areas on that sensory um, cortex. OK, so that's it. Any questions then on chapter 15? All right. So you guys can take a five-minute break, and then we're going to